So thank you all for joining us today on our Interfaith Project. Today we're here with Aaron Shafawala. That was awesome. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, would you just care to introduce yourself and like talk a little bit about yourself and stuff like that? Yeah, I uh, grew up mostly in Ohio. I uh, in, ended up in Utah. Today I'm a full-time computer programmer. Uh, I'm also a co-pastor at the Mission Church in South Jordan. Um, and I've got three kids. And uh, I'm also an evangelist, which uh, the, the, we, we by that term mean uh, maybe somebody who's doing proselytism, especially to strangers. So, yeah. Kind of like what we would call missionary work in our church and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I'm a, a evangelical Christian. You might call us born again or Protestant. Um, part of the larger family of historic Protestant churches. So it's a, it's a pretty big, big umbrella. So, yeah. That's really cool. Do you think you could like explain to us some of your basic beliefs? Yeah. Uh, I think... Um, to start with, we take the Bible as our foundation. So the Protestant project, if you will, is to um, look at the Bible as closely as we can with God's help by the Holy Spirit and believe as much as we possibly can and submit to all of it uh, because it's all of God's, it's, it, it is all God's word. It's without error, it's uh, God breathed. So we want to believe every word of it and obey it and um, harmonize it as best as we can and from that, we, um, we hold the classic Christian view of the Trinity, of one God, three persons in relationship. Uh, they're, they're distinct persons who love each other, and they've, they've always been in this love relationship as one being. Uh, they never shook hands and met each other. They never had to meet each other. They never had to start a relationship. And probably the, the third pillar there would be um, grace, is that um, because Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, and pay the final penalty and price for our sins on the cross. Um, people who who believe that he has risen from the dead, but he's the he's the real deal. He's he's Lord. He's King. He paid for our sins. Um, he said it is finished. Uh, he, he paid the full penalty. People who believe that Jesus did that and they and they trust him um, can immediate, immediately receive the, the complete forgiveness of all their sins and have an inside-out change where you have a new relationship with God. Um, you fight for holiness, you, you hate your sin, um, you want to kill the, 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 the evil desires inside of you and grow in holiness and attach yourself to other believers. And, uh, and then and, and when we die, we, it's like we have a backstage pass. When we die, we're going to go and be with God forever, um, with his people forever. So, sorry, long answer. But. Oh, that's honestly perfect. I thought those beliefs were very beautiful and very awesome. And as you know, like as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, we believe that, you know, God is the Father, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and, and, you know, the Holy Ghost is the third member of the Godhead. We believe that, you know, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God along with the Bible, and they're meant to be used together and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But one thing I love there is you're talking on grace and, like, the grace of Jesus Christ and stuff like that. Because we believe the same thing. We believe, like, through the atonement of Jesus Christ and, and through the grace that He's given us, we can all also return and live with God again. We can also enter heaven and stuff like that by accepting his atonement and doing the things he has asked us to do. So I, I find that really beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like from our discussions elsewhere, um, when that gets parsed out and like teased out and sifted out, the, the, the differences are pretty substantial uh, in terms of the worldview. Worldview is a really cool term. Yeah. It refers to how you see the, the big picture and, the, and the, uh, all the parts and how they fit together. Yeah. And when we look at like who God is and what our purpose is, and what our nature is, and where we're going, where we came from. Um, grace, in our worldview, uh, if it just helps, it's like grace is meant to show off God's mercy. And so uh, we can't, we, because of grace, I can't boast in myself. Um, I can't pretend like I'm worthy or qualified or good enough or you know, religiously performing enough. Um, the gift that I'm given is eternal life and full forgiveness of sins. And um, I've maybe this language might help, every Christian has available to them in the immediate moment, but mere, merely by weak but genuine faith, to have their calling and election made sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's as though they have their second anointing. It's as though if they were to die that moment, they're going to be in the very presence of God um, and be with him forever. So that's a benefit I have even apart from any ritual or even apart from having have, have proven my worthiness or anything like that. Anything like that. Yeah. 
And honestly, like that, that's really awesome that you have that faith in Christ and that you, you want to be close with Jesus Christ and want to do the things he would have you do. Like, that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Now, to start off with this interview, we just have a couple questions for you. Thanks. Uh, sorry, my phone is having some slight struggles. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. How do you, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Chalmers. Chalmers. Yeah, good job. So, the first question is, in the most recent poll in the U.S. religious landscape, uh, suggests that over the past couple of decades, significantly fewer people identify as Christian, and that the church attendance among those who identify as Christian has been decreasing to a point that more people do not attend church more than once a year, other than like weddings, funerals, etc. cetera, uh, uh, than those who attend regularly. What do you think are like the social implications of this trend and how this is going? When you say implications, do you mean like cause or like consequences? Yeah, like consequences, that's what I mean. Um, I think people have a hole inside their soul that they need to fill with God. And God is the only key that'll fit. It's the only, the only one who can really satisfy what we're made for. And so when people give up on God and they give up on Jesus, uh, they're going to try to fill that hole with something. And I think the consequence will be that people will try to, um, even if they don't see it as a new religion, they're going to try to um, seek out some new form of spirituality or new religion. That might be politics. That might be like modern progressive uh, ideas of being woke. That might be um, might be a, your, your favorite dietary fad. It, people try to seize on something that makes them feel like they have a purpose or something like that. But I think the consequence ultimately will be a downward spiral. Um, and the, the, the reason I believe that is um, the, the fruit of, of uh, true spirituality and the, the fruit of satisfaction in God, it can't be severed from Christ. Um, so when people cut off that root, I think society eventually starts to disintegrate and uh, it, they burn out and it's pretty terrible. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, we believe in, you know, you have, you have faith by works. And you also, we also believe that we need to love one another and stuff like that. So when you lose that foundation with Christ, when you lose that relationship with him and stuff like that, you, like, you lose joy. Like, you have temporary happiness, but you don't have, like, lasting or eternal joy or anything like that. So I, I can definitely see what you're saying there of like the importance of religion. And the, it's actually really cool because you answered our second question, which was uh, people are saying they're more and more spiritual and stuff like that. And your thoughts on that. And like, uh, so what, what are your thoughts on being spiritual, just to reiterate? So true spirituality is only found in Christ. Everything else will be empty. Everything else will be uh, ultimately unsatisfying. Um, idols always let us down. And if, if we don't have the true Jesus, then we have an idol, and an idol always breaks our heart. It always lets us down. Um, it ends up destroying us. So tr true spirituality, um, I, I don't think anyone on earth can have that ultimately apart from having a relationship with Jesus Christ and having their sins freely forgiven. But when it comes to generic spirituality, this is really interesting because I've had atheist friends that are really excited about um, reducing everything down to nature. That's all there is is the material parts and there's the laws of physics, and um, it, it's, uh, it's really interesting that someone who says that there's no God and there's no ultimate objective right or wrong, no objectively aesthetic beauty, um, and there's no like intrinsic human value, and there's no ultimate purpose to life, excuse me, no ultimate purpose to life. They say that, but then they go and they live as though their naturalism isn't true. They, 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 they get really upset about uh, politics, for example, because they have this inner instinct that we ought to treat each other a certain way or that human beings really are deserving of dignity and value and respect. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that people are like inescapably spiritual. And even if they try to act like robots or they try to act like they're naturalists, they end up participating in sort of a larger romantic worldview, which leaks out that they're really, sp they're really spiritualists at heart and they really do want some sort of spiritual worldview. Yeah, that, that's something I find very interesting. Like a lot of this spiritual thing I hear about, in reality it's to like control morals and like to look at your morality and stuff like that. But that's one thing I find very interesting is like morals in reality from at least what I've read and what I've seen oftentimes come from religion. Stuff like, you know, like, you know, commandments and, and other things like that nature. And I feel like that, that's a very important thing is making sure like not only 
people are there, but also that they're moral, that they want to do good things. And that's one thing that I think religion plays a pivotal role in, is like help helping people be morally good, morally right, stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, it, it seems like, um, at least in the Western world, the moral framework we have is downstream from the Judeo-Christian standard. Yeah. So even if people aren't Christian, they're participating in a culture that's inherited a lot from Judeo-Christian ethics. Um, in, in Christianity, uh, it's, it's it really interesting. We want to be moral, but we don't want to define our religion as moralism. And yeah. what we mean by that is, even if we're really good at helping people know what's right and wrong, and giving the people structure, um, the Christianity says that uh, we're in a pretty bad place at that point still. Because even if you tell me all the right rules, even if you train me really well, um, if you send me to the best schools on how to be a good citizen and a yeah. good human being, I have a really deep carnal, carnal prop, a carnality problem. I have, I'm bent toward being uh, corrupt in my spirit. So I deeply need to be born again and I deeply need to be forgiven. And if I depend on being moral for that, um, I'll never me measure up. But if I have a gospel of grace that says, uh, because of the blood of Jesus, my sins can be freely forgiven and I can be um, right with God um, as a free gift, then that, that kind of reorients everything. Like It's like, okay, um, I'm not being moral so that God will love me or so that God will accept me. I'm freely accepted by God through Jesus by faith. And so now I want to pursue ethics and holiness and morality and killing my hypocrisy and confessing my sin. Yeah, that's one thing we believe is very important as well. Like, I think it was uh, the Apostle David A. Bednar. He said, our goal in life is not only to overcome sin, but the desire to sin as well. Mm -hmm. Like, we want to be, as Paul said, new creature in Christ. We want to change to the point where we, we, we want to be with Heavenly Father, where we want to be in heaven instead of it being like a... Like a Le know, legalist, or yeah, a legalist, or like, oh, I have to because everyone else is doing it. You know, something that we truly want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, that was a really good answer, I have to say. And uh, I lost my notes, but that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. R remind me where you're from again. I'm from Montana, actually. Yeah. And the weather down here is. Uh, it's way warmer. It's way, way warmer. warmer. Okay. Like I, I would show you, but I, I'm sweating a lot right now. <laughs> it's way too warm outside. <laughs> yeah. So with the recent closure of churches due to COVID, what do you think are the long-term effects for, what do you think the long-term effects will be for religious people? And how would you recommend to like cope with these issues of like churches having to close because COVID-19 and stuff like that? Mm. <clears throat> well, let me say up front, um, I don't know what the long-term effects will be. So I'll just take a stab at it. I'll just try to figure out, think out loud. I, it, it seems like God is up to something, but I'm not quite sure. So I'm in, a, I'm in a holding pattern, I'm waiting to see what God's up to. Um, it's hard to tell if um, there will be some sort of revival where people will feel more spiritually hungry to think about fatality and death and you know, eternity, um, or, or maybe it's both, but or perhaps it's um, society is being judged and we're being handed over to <clears throat> our own preferences, which is, you know, we don't want God, we, we just, so it's hard to tell, but when it comes to, like, churches and COVID and, you know, being stuck at home for a while, um, I, I'm just guessing, but I have, to, I have to wonder if a lot of people in America just won't go back to church afterwards. I don't know, but I have to wonder, too, if there's a huge section of people that, um, genuine Christians, who were stuck at home for a while and they have a new appreciation for fellowship. They're like, oh, I'm not a robot. I'm not, I'm not just a vat, and a, uh, I'm not a brain in a vat. I'm, like, I'm human. I, I need to like, go and see people and worship God with other people and like, touch other people. And I, I need yeah. to like, take communion physically. And I, so I have to wonder too if there'll be like, a, a newfound appreciation among Christians for uh, meeting and greeting and maybe we'll go back to the like the new testament holy kiss after yeah because <laughs> we're just so excited and like that that's one thing i, I worry about too because oftentimes especially in the church we have people who go to church because they believe it because they believe it's the right thing to do and because like they want to be closer with god but then you also have this other group of people that just do it because it's the culture because you know they feel like they're obligated to so I, I do worry about those effects, like how it will affect that group of people who don't really want to go. And also the people who are dying to go, I, 
I can't Im I can't imagine how joyful they'll be when like things start back up again and and like how like how much like appreciation we'll have for stuff like church meetings in the future mm -hmm. because as you said fellowship being with people of your same belief is, is a wonderful feeling yeah well, I'm sure we're thankful for zoom oh yes we are all thankful for zoom but <laughs> it's, it's kind of lame compared it's not to the same uh, being personal with people yeah yeah as missionaries we're like doing a lot of teaching over zoom and I can confidently say it is not the same at mm -hmm. all like you you try and crack a joke you have about like four seconds of lag before they laugh. It doesn't work too well. Oh, oh the latency. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the next question is, well, on the topic of COVID, this time, oh, sorry, this has been a challenging time for people of all faiths and, and those of none. Some wonder if there is God and if there is one, like how he, he can let something like this happen. Others suggest that God, is, this is like God getting our attention. Mm -hmm. So... In what ways have you like seen God's hand in your life during this pandemic? So personally for me in my life, um, I had some kids at a charter school and you know, overnight they were being homeschooled or schooling from home, or a hybrid from homeschooling and, and then online schooling from home. But let me just say, God bless you, like homeschooling stuff. <laughs> I, well, I, <clears throat> it's pretty cool when God blesses a family to, uh, have the patience to learn to have their kids sit still and manage conflict and manage attentions. Yeah, that's like, that's like harder than starting a million dollar company. Te teachers right? deserve a raise. We can both agree on oh, that. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and, and moms are amazing. Um, yes. So w we were suddenly all at home and um, we were spending more time together, which was a, a perk. It was, it was a blessing. And um, we suddenly, uh, my gym shut down permanently and I'm working from home and everyone's at home so all of a sudden our commitments are sort of cut and our weekly and daily commitments so um, it gave me an opportunity it was felt like with God given opportunity to kind of reset and think about my weekly and daily priorities and it made me have it gave me the opportunity to think about big family decisions so I, I felt like God was really helping me like reset my view of my priorities that was really helpful <clears throat> it, it it there was a peak time when you know at the very beginning people thought it was going to be a lot worse yeah. i mean like a lot worse and so we're all thinking about death so that's helpful that's that's like a smelling salt mm -hmm. smelling salts can be super helpful they just kind of awaken you to um big questions you know i'm going to die someday i'm going to face jesus he's going to judge the living and the dead um like, what, are, what do I really want to do with my life? That kind of thing. So uh, if I could broaden it a little bit, um, I thought it was really cool um, to see a lot of moms come home and be with their kids um, around the dinner table. Um, a lot of challenges to that, but I thought it was overall a beautiful thing to see families in the living room together, in the kitchen together again, and dads at home seeing you know their families again. So it felt like God was helping Christians be more home oriented. I felt like God was up. God was up to something, helping Christian families um, reorient our view of home life. So, I definitely feel like COVID, like while it does have many trials, is also a blessing too, because it makes us, as you said, reevaluate, reevaluate what's important to us, why we're doing things, and that's one thing like I found. So I've been a missionary for most of my time during COVID nineteen. And it made me reevaluate why am I doing missionary work? Am I doing it because I want to be like successful or because I want all this personal recognition? Or am I doing it out of love for my fellow man? Hmm. Because I want to help everyone come closer to Jesus Christ and stuff like that. Sorry, I lost my voice there. And stuff like that. So, in, in my opinion, I think like, as you said, like it, it is a blessing. And it like, God definitely has a hand in it. It's not, it's not all negative. It's not all bad. Hmm. Like there's still good to come from it. Yeah, there, um, <clears throat> in Romans eight twenty eight, Paul says, "For we know that, um, for we know that, all things work together for good for those that love God, for those that have been called according to His purpose." So, even if it's terrible, even if even if there's death and sickness in my family at some point here, um, God is not. He's not weak. He's not. Um, God doesn't go. Oh no, COVID! What do I do now? I didn't see this coming. Um, no, he has a, totally has a plan and a purpose behind it, a good, sanctifying purpose behind it. 
He loves my family. It, it, only good will come of it f- for my family. Um, God loves me. Um, it, it, it's really hard for people to put the two and two together. You know, suffering, COVID, God's goodness. Um, how do you put this? Well, I just know they're both true. Yeah. And honestly, like, that's one thing we believe is, like, suffering and trials can lead to you becoming a stronger and better person overall. So, like, we don't suffer needlessly. Mm-hmm. We suffer because when we suffer, we, when we have trials or challenges, it allows God to show His hand more in our lives, to help us more personally. I found personally in my life, and I've been at my low stages when life isn't going the way I want to and stuff like that, that God has been able to help me best in those times and teach me the most in those times. And I've noticed when I'm like at the high stages where I think I'm all that and a bag of chips and all, I've noticed that's when I'm spiritually less inclined and I don't learn as much and it leads to the aforementioned low stages. Yeah, it's almost dangerous not to have trials. Yes. But we're going to chill, coast, uh, do Netflix and social media and computer games and, um, and just stop thinking about God and eternity and um, human suffering. It's, it's like, thank you, Lord, for giving us COVID. Thank you. I mean, please bless the people that are suffering. And thank you for giving us um, suffering that brings about our good. So. Yeah. There was something that D. Todd Christopherson, one of our apostles, he, he like challenged all the members of the church to do, and that was to not only like actively seek, but even sometimes ask for correction and trials. So that way we could become better. So it's not like, a, oh, we want bad things to happen to us, but so we can learn more, so we can be closer to God and Jesus Christ. And that's one thing I, I find amazing is, is in reality, God is in the details. He cares about us all individually and wants to help us all individually and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah. And then the next little bit of that same question is, uh, what advice do you have for others who are honestly searching for God but don't know what to look for or how to find Him? Um, <clears throat> the first thing is, if you're in a season where you feel the desire to um, seek out truth, or even if you have a fear of, of hell or of judgment or death, um, uh, use it. Channel it to seek out um, Jesus. So as a Christian, I don't think there's any hope in seeking out a generic deity <clears throat> or any other uh, deity outside of Christianity, um, but ra- rather to focus with the with the laser sharp focus on Jesus. So my, my particular um, invitation or challenge, or even, even ambassadorial declaration as a Christian to the world would be, open up one of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and just gorge yourself on the words of Jesus and let Jesus draw you in. There's something captivating about Jesus. He's, he's really hard to dismiss uh, and, and let him uh, define himself on his own terms and let his words <clears throat> be the authority in your life. So <clears throat> if, if somebody is, is thinking, well, I don't really know if Jesus is the real deal. I don't know if he's worth my attention. Well, he happens to be the most reputable religious figure in the world for good reason. So he's worth, he's worth at least investigation. And even if you don't get but through maybe a few chapters of one of the four Gospels, um, Jesus has a way of capturing us with his, the authority of his works and his words, um, the, way, the way that he speaks to his, even his religious enemies. He's a total boss. Uh, uh, he, the way he speaks to people who are uh, hurting and, and weak, who say, Lord, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. The way that he heals a leper or a blind person. There's something that is inimitable about Jesus. Like you can't, there, there's no other religious figure like him. No, no matter how um, exciting they are, how exciting or charismatic someone is. There's no YouTube star that um, any of my, my kids can find that will be, sustain their attention the way that Jesus can. So I, I, would, I would implore someone like that to read one of the four Gospels, gorge yourself on the words of Jesus, and pray that God would open your eyes to experience the person of Jesus um, the way he was meant to be experienced. Yeah, and honestly, that I agree completely. Like One of the first things I did the first book of scripture I actually ever read was Mark because my seminary teacher, they challenged me to read one of the Gospels in the New Testament and I noticed Mark was the shortest so I went with that one. But I read Mark and I loved it. I loved seeing Jesus Christ and his character. Like how he was, as you said, a total boss and dealing with people who hated him but also his constant love 
through everyone. Like, I remember then, like, after I got done with Mark, I was so infatuated that I moved on to Luke. And I was reading at the end when, after Jesus Christ was crucified, when he says, forgive them, they know not what they do. And I realized, like, the character of Jesus Christ was so selfless. He didn't have any, like, personal vendetta or personal gain from anything he did in his life. Like, he, he could have done anything as the Son of God, but he willfully chose to be the Lamb of God, to, to die for us, to allow us all to return and live with Heavenly Father. And I found that so amazing. Like, I would agree, like, definitely read some of the New Testament, learn more about the character of Jesus Christ, ask, ask for his atonement to bless your life. Like, it's honestly, it's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, what, what is more conceivably beautiful than that God, <clears throat> who's not weak, he's omnipotent, he knows everything, um, he's, he has all power, uh, he's, he can't be contested, uh, he's over all nature, um, he has no need to learn, what, what conceivably is a more beautiful than that this most high, almighty, first God would um, condescend? I mean, what, I mean, what a trip down, like all the way down. Yeah, willfully become a, a man. And, and not just a man, a baby in a dirty manger. Uh, with, with poor parents that didn't really know much, like his dad was a carpenter. This omniscient, omnipotent being became a... Um, a a homeschooled Jewish boy uh, who, if you punched him in the arm, it would have hurt. He's not Superman. He's not a demigod. And he's like truly man. So out of love, it's as, it's as though you were over an anthill and you became an ant to show your love to the ant. God became a baby. God became a man on purpose. And then on purpose made his way to Jerusalem knowing that he would uh, suffer an excruciating, public, embarrassing, shameful, as it were, death um, at the hands of others. And yet he says, no one takes my life from me. I give it up of my own accord. And he does that to show ultimately his victory and his power over death. And Satan's like, aha, I got him. And Jesus, is, and Jesus wins by, by dying. And he, and he shows, uh, uh, sorry, uh, one more thing. At the cross, the love the mercy of God, and the justice of God. You can't get rid of either. So you, it, Jesus has to uh, punish sin. He has to, pun- he has to mete out justice. And yet he loves humanity and he loves his people. <clears throat> so at the cross, there's this, this, this kiss of, the, of beautiful attributes of God's mercy and his justice where the wrath of God is satisfied um, that I deserve, it's, it's absorbed in Jesus, and the mercy that I don't deserve is granted to me. It's, there's nothing better. It's honestly... Nothing a, in Marvel, nothing yeah. in DC Comics. No, yeah, I agree. They're, all, they're all wannabes. Because, because, you know, when Jesus Christ, we believe he was the Son of God, but he willfully did all that to submit himself fully to the Father, to do all the things that the Father asked him to do. And what I always love is, this was said, I think, in a talk by, by James... No, no. Truman G. Matson, I think it was. And it was during uh, his condemning before Pilate. And Pilate said, do you know I can like do all this stuff to you? And then he, he put in perspective the power that Jesus Christ had. And he said, Jesus wouldn't even have had to blink. And they all would have been destroyed. And he could have done left and just gone back to heaven. He, he didn't do anything wrong. He, he was sinless. He had all power. But he willfully chose to let it all happen for us. Like, is there a greater act of love and because that act of love was so great that mercy could satisfy justice, like, agreed, there's nothing better. Nothing better than that thought, that, like, beauty within it. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? When I was in high school, um, I was 17 years old, and um, I was learning more about myself. And one of the things I learned was that I'm not merely someone who sins occasionally, and I'm not merely just a sinner um, by matter of repetition. I'm a sinner by nature, and I have a bent toward car- carnal things. And um, sin goes deeper than I realized it did. And I'm, I'm capable of doing evils that I didn't think I was capable of, given the right circumstances. So what was pretty daunting for me is if I have, if I have to be... Uh, if I have to measure up, if I have to be worthy enough or qualified enough to receive God's mercy, um, I'm in a bad place. 
even if God says, you know, I'll assist you, you know, in being better and someday you'll be good enough, I'd still be in a bad place. So what was revolutionary for me is reading Romans. In Romans 4, there's two verses that just God used to uh, change me forever. Uh, Romans 4 verse 4 says, when a man works, his wages are not counted to him as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And what was amazing about that to me is, it's like, well, I'm, a, I'm ungodly. Uh, and I think Paul, we all are, you know. Oh, totally. We, we all make mistakes. We all fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. And, and Paul says, well, if you work for it, like you're, like you're getting your wages, like you're getting what's owed to you, what's earned, then he won't give you the gift. But if you stop working for it as though you could earn it, as though you know it could be wages, and you start trusting God, well, what kind of God? Trusting God who justifies the ungodly. Well, I'm ungodly, and God, this language is interesting. He, he justifies the ungodly. He counts righteous the unrighteous. He counts godly the ungodly. Um, that, so when I read that verse, uh, to him who does not work but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, it was like God gave me permission to pray a certain kind of prayer. And it was, Lord, I am not good enough yet. I'm not worthy enough yet. But would you just go to the bottom of me right now? Just right now. Like, no, don't wait for anything. Would you just go to the bottom of me right now and completely forgive me because of what Jesus did on the cross? Um, would you just do that? And it was like a whole new relationship opened up with God. And um, my, uh, my debts were paid. And then, like, I remember, like, shortly after that, I had this new logic seeping through my head, and it was like, okay, um, if God forgave me when I was a big punk, I was lusty, I was arrogant, I was difficult, I was irrational, um, I was ignorant of God, I was an enemy of God. If God forgave me when I was in such a terrible condition, um, I probably should love my enemies. Oh, yeah. And I probably should love difficult people who aren't worthy of my love. Like, I should just freely love them because God loved me when I was in a bad state. So it was a pretty cool transformation. And so that's where I think the cross can just blow up someone's life in a good way. And that's something I love. Oftentimes, like we have this, I don't know, like people put this like connotation and the stigma on like the atonement saying that, oh, well, the, the atonement of Jesus Christ only applies to certain people or certain things or certain situations. And quite frankly, that's not it. The atonement applies to everyone. Jesus Christ suffered for everyone and God gives it as a free gift to everyone who wants to receive it. Like, and I know we have like obviously differences in how I believe that gift is received, but I think that's beautiful that you like took in those scriptures and truly like pondered them and, and had that faith to act on it. And like, honestly, that, that's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And it, it's in reality what we should all strive to do is strive to become closer with God, closer with Jesus Christ, to become a new creature. Because I, I agree, we are all fallen, we are all carnal, we all want to sin. But with Jesus Christ, we can literally change our nature, become that new creature, and do all the things that God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Uh, so, obviously, Aaron, you, you are very, very familiar with, you know, Latter-day Saint theology and the church's theology in general. So, I, the question I have for you is, is there, is there anything you've, like, learned from the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, that you personally have, like, uh, brought into your life or anything like that? Um. So let me just say up front, I think all of the great things about my Latter-day Saint neighbors and all of the best parts of the Latter-day Saint faith, I think are downstream from Judeo-Christianity. I think they're, I would say they're borrowed. I would say they're, um, uh, uh, they're borrowed from the Bible or they're borrowed from Judeo-Christianity. So, but among those that I, I most appreciate would be um, work ethic, um, I love, I love the, the, they call it the, the term for it is Protestant work ethic, if you've heard yeah. that term, uh, the social term. Um, I love, I, people make fun of this, but I love it. People go to BYU and they marry early and, they, and, and Utahns have more kids. So I think marrying young and having, like valuing the raising of a family with, with uh, a bunch of kiddos, it's a beautiful thing. Um, disproportionately having, you know, moms nurture kids in the home you know, especially the young ones. Um, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think especially in the 20th century, um, Latter-day Saints and Protestants have at an ethical level 
um, enjoyed a lot of agreement on uh, marriage, a, a single man, single woman, one man, one woman, um, uh, you know, scriptural monogamy, uh, natural monogamy, that marriage is one man and one woman. And so I think, you know, up until recently, at least like we've had a lot of agreement on the ethical framework of that. So, um, but, but I, I really appreciate it. Uh, one more thing, patriotism. Um, I think patriotism. Don't, don't, don't ask the little flag we have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think patriotism can be godly because it's just a matter of um, caring about the community you live in and honoring those who've gone before you as much as you can, even there's a lot of warts in everyone's heritage. Um, and seeking the good of your community and being thankful and patriotic. So I think, I think to some degree, everybody can do that in the country that they're in. And I think Latter-day Saints really um, rightly pride themselves in being uh, patriotic. Um, there's a lot of fireworks that go off. That's right. <laughs> Not yeah. that that's patriotism, but <laughs> we just like blow stuff up. <laughs> but I, I, no, I, I love being in Utah. People, people who um, grow up in Utah and become jaded and they want to leave, like I'm like, oh, it's a great place. What are you talking about? Like this is, I, I'm, I'm coming here. You're leaving. I'm, I'll, just, I'll stay. Uh, I'll take your spot. Like I, I so I defend the, the Latter Day Saint uh, culture in many ways from maybe a secular progressive liberal critic who can't stand the cult. There's, I think there's a ton of beautiful things about it worth um, commending and appreciating, thanking God for. Abs absolutely. And that, that's one thing I, I love about the Protestant faith is, so I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact name, but what I love about Protestants in general is the weight they put on the grace of Jesus Christ in scripture. Like I feel oftentimes like people tend to like downplay the atonement of Jesus Christ or downplay the importance of scriptures and stuff like that. And that's one thing I loved because like there's a point in my life where I was like learning more about the Protestant church. Well, sorry, like a, a Protestant church, church not yeah. the one. And one, I, one thing I loved that I took away from it that I, I truly loved was the importance of studying scripture, the importance of relying on the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's something that like, I still hold a very heavy weight in today because I truly believe that those things are pivotal to learn more about your Lord and Savior, and also to you know learn to rely on grace day by day, minute by minute, second by second, moment by moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, sorry, I don't remember the exact word, wording of the next question. Um, yeah. Maybe the second part of that question. Lisa. Oh yeah. Have you encountered any principles from the Church of Jesus Christ that have made you a, a better person or anything yeah, like that? Is there a no, I think that was three. Second of three, right? Yeah. Where there was, there's a yeah. part about if there's any um, other beliefs, basically, that uh, Mormons can learn from. Well, that's, yeah, that, number that, three. that's the third one. Oh, the third one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Don't worry. I appreciate you trying to have my back, Elder Crossley. Yeah, the, on the second one, um, so immediately what comes to mind is my coworkers yeah. um, in Utah. I, and, and the sample's probably skewed because I just get to work with some really cool people. So I don't know if that's a, a representative sample of Utah in general, but, um, uh, you know, and again, I, I, as a Protestant, I think all of the best things about Mormonism and all the best things about my Latter-day Saint neighbors are downstream borrowed, I'd even say stolen, from a historic Judeo Christianity and, and the sort of the or echoes of the biblical worldview. But um, the, the co workers that I get to work with in Utah are um, hardworking, they're enthusiastic, they're humble, um, they're really easy to work with, they're really easy to become friends with. Um, and so, I mean, I can't not become a better person, um, I can't not benefit, I'll say, from working in a community with people like that. I'm better off for, I, I wouldn't want to be, I mean, that's what stinks about COVID. Partly yeah. is that we're all stuck at home and we're all doing Zoom. At homework I, is not the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to be in an office with my Utah neighbors, um, uh, working together, sweating together as it were. I'm a programmer, so I don't really sweat. <laughs> but I, I want to work hard together and accomplish great things together and um, rub off on each other because I, I, I love my Latter-day Saint coworkers. I, I think they're, uh, uh, people worth worth imitating. Yeah, honestly, that that's really awesome. Like that, that's really cool. I, I'm glad you have such good coworkers. I'm I'm kind of jealous because the one time I had a job, my coworkers were not that good. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, one of them was was my brother. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carry over the relationship into workplace. Yeah, yeah, the, the, those relationships never are the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then the last part of that question is, you know. Um, is there anything you think like Latter-day Saints could like do better or learn more about or anything like that? 
So I've been doing evangelism for uh, about 14 years. Yeah. And one of the neat things about going to downtown Salt Lake City is we get to meet people who are tourists or business convention goers or skiers. And when we um, meet people who are from California or Chicago or New York, you know, um, there seems to be a more immediate willingness to have interfaith discussions that are, um, I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't project this contrast I'm about to make on you, by the way, on a personal level, it's just a general observation. Um, the, but the people I meet from California and Chicago and New York, in general, huge exceptions, <laughs> but in general, they're more immediately willing to have uh, difficult conversations about uh, faith where you contrast your beliefs, you, you defend and advocate for the truth, you, you sort of hash things out, you, um, um, you, you go back and forth, you, you get to learn about more about each other, but you get to um, point to the truth and really just extract out the most important things and have a really hearty, spirited uh, discussion yeah. um, about it. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of satisfaction in that at different levels um, and a lot of pleasure to be had. Um, mo- among the secondary benefits are I get to ha- make friends and I get to connect with people that are very different from me. Um, it's really cool. I think in Utah, I, I don't know if this is Latter-day Saints in general, but in Utah, there seems to be a little bit more of a, a, a lot more sensitivity, uh, maybe a little bit more skittishness about having um, spirited discussions yeah. uh, between different faiths. And there's a, there's a kind of, um, that, that can lead to passive aggressiveness or kind of like um, false sweetness or just avoidance. And so um, I don't resent that. It, it, for us on the street, what it just means is that we try to practice extra sensitivity, extra gentleness, because we know there's different cultural um, thresholds for what you can do. Yes, yeah, so you could probably just, it's probably leaking out of me. I'm probably on the, the spectrum of, let's talk till 2 a.m. in the morning and just hash everything out and have fun. Uh, uh, but, as yeah. down as I am, unfortunately. Oh, no, 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 not today. Right. Missionaries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's okay. <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm more uh, overt, and um, I think Utahans are, um, uh, a lot of people have grown up watching Fox News, yeah. seeing um, debates devolve, and I've been a part of debates that devolve into just bad behavior, but, um, but a lot of people are scared about having religious or political discussions around you know, the Thanksgiving table because they just want to keep the peace, and so I think what we need in Utah is like better role models and better examples of situations where people are able to have really helpful um, spirited discussions about things that most matter um, in a way that's repeatable. So. And like that, that's something I actually very much agree with. So as a missionary, you know, we go out and we talk to people all the time. And there are people who like want to hear from us and people who really don't want to hear from us. But the thing that I always love is we believe, you know, each religion has like some foundational like good truth in it. You know, like we believe like our church has all of it, but each religion has a little piece of like good foundational truth. And that's one thing I love is I've seen in a lot of religions where a lot of people like discount it or or like don't understand something or whatever, where they just kind of don't see that good foundational truth in it. And that's one thing I love about like having spirited discussions or like just having discussions in general is you can learn more about your own faith and learn more about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from them. And like, don't, don't be afraid like it's gonna change your worldview or whatever because honestly it's good to learn more. Like there's no such thing as bad knowledge in my opinion. All knowledge is good knowledge. Yeah, I, I agree. And one part especially is that um, when I interact with people who are very different from I in their worldview, it causes me to triangulate. <laughs> it causes me to like situate what I believe in contrast or in comparison to other worldviews. Um, and so I have to think more clearly about it. If I'm stuck in a bubble, in a homogeny, um, I'm just floating downstream. And I just assume that what, I've taught, what I'm taught is true. But when I have to start um, putting my beliefs in, under the light of scrutiny and then you know, comparing and contrasting them to other beliefs, I learn a lot about myself and other people. It also causes me to doubt it, in a good way. It causes me to go do homework. It causes me to um, reconsider, uh, someone might say, that's not, I, I posted a verse on uh, Facebook this morning, by the way, and my friend kindly commented and said, in a m- number of words, I don't think that's what the context means. And I took it, I t- I took it down and I, I was like, I actually think I saw that post. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Gideon being brave or, or uh, Gideon being a, 
a, a noble man who is uh, uh, the angel of the Lord. Like, see, if you take the verse out of context, it sounds like he's being commended, but it's really just sort of a, 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 <laughs> a forecast of what will later, he has a calling that will later be fleshed out, but he's at that point in history pretty uh, skittish. And uh, uh, Anyway, my bigger point is when, I, when I'm in a community of my own and with other, uh, when I'm interacting with other communities, um, it forces me to um, be corrected, and it forces me to look at the evidence. Um, and uh, I have to, you know, everyone's going to ask theirself whether they're an atheist or in a religion. Am I crazy? Mm -hmm. Am I just believing this because I've been taught this? Um, am I, do I have motivated reasoning for believing this because of my current social situation? Um, and so having these interfaith discussions um, or evangelistic encounters uh, really uh, helps me uh, reevaluate things for better. So yeah, and honestly, that I completely agree. Like that's the thing I love. Whenever I get in like a doctrinal discussion, they mention something that I don't know about. I love doing that homework. I love learning more about what I believe. Because as as I'm sure you and I both know, religion isn't just oh one day I get it. Like I know it all. I'm good. Like yeah. religion is constant homework, constant learning, constant just learning more about who Jesus Christ is, who God is, what they mean to you, your relationship with them. And honestly, I love that. So the, just the last question we have for you, Aaron, is is there anything you'd like recommend for people in these challenging times of COVID-19 to like help them out or anything like that? Um, there's a book by John Piper, um, COVID-19, that I think people should take a look at. Um, but I would revisit the earlier uh, recommendation that people go back to the scriptures and pick one of the four gospels. Um, I, I, I think about it like a route you take every morning to work or a path you've hiked a lot is when, you, when you're familiar enough with a path, you start to know it really well, like the back of your hand. And I think it, it behooves everyone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus to pick one of the four gospels and to know it so well. Um, I mean, if you need to treat it like an academic, academic exercise at least for like a week or two or up front, yeah. you know, for long-term Take fruit. notes, journal, whole nine yards, just go for Can it. Can you pick a, a chapter and know what it's about? Do you know the, sort of the, the winding path of it? Do you, do you, are you familiar? Do you, are you familiar with the historical context of who it's being written to, why it's being written, stuff like that? Can you finish the sentences of other people who are quoting, or at least can you, can, if you have, you're probably getting ready to have kids someday, if you, if you have a, um, a five-year-old, can you tell the stories at a dinner table? And I mean, it, it, I want to be a missionary to my kids. So I, I, would, I would encourage people to uh, reassess the person of Jesus Christ on the basis of his words in scripture, in his works, and let them have more authority than our feelings, more authority than, I mean, our feelings are going to be so fickle in a COVID season. We're, we're going to have seasons of um, feeling uh, anxious or aloof or apathetic or burnout and or vigilant, ah, like we, we have got to take scripture and put our feelings under scripture and let scripture um, tame our feelings and subordinate our feelings. Uh, and uh, Jesus, uh, uh, religion's not a game. It's not just a fun intellectual exercise. Um, COVID is going to be over at some point and we're going to be tempted to go straight back to Netflix, social media, computer games. Um, or infotainment. We're going to be not about thinking about God or eternity or death or life. So if we should use this as an opportunity to revisit the things that are most important and care, care more about that than anything else in the whole world, more important than the stimulus package, more important than um, whether you find a wife, more important than whether your girlfriend breaks up with you. Um, I don't know if you guys have girlfriends. <laughs> I don't know if you uh, have I don't think any anybody write letters, but, but it, knowing the words of Jesus matters. Uh, what does Jesus say? He says, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus says in John 6, my words are full of the spirit and of life. And Jesus says in John 5, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So, yeah. And honestly, I, I agree. Like, I think in this time, one great way to help is to delve deep into your scriptures. Like, read the Bible, as we would say, read the Book of Mormon. Like, get, get familiar with them. One thing I love that you said when you were talking earlier about, like, do you know the stories well enough? You could teach your child them. 
It was a quote from John Taylor. It is true wisdom and true knowledge to take something that is complex, grand, and mysterious and simplify it to the point where a child can understand it. And that's one thing I love. Like, honestly, take that time. Get familiar with your scriptures. Get that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's, it's pivotal. It, it's going to be needed long after COVID's done. It's going to be needed... It's going to be needed now. It's going to be needed forever to have that relationship, to have that knowledge, to have your scriptures with you. But Aaron, I just want to say thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you for being willing to be. You bet. I'd shake your hand, but it's COVID season. Uh, Well, elbows seem to work. Reach over.